So three days of testing, guys, in the books. Uh, some interesting things obviously happening out on track, especially with uh, Red Bull and the RB20. Uh, where do you guys want to start with this one? Because there is quite a bit to digest from different conversations we've had with people, different conversations we've had with each other. But first, I guess, let's start with Max Verstappen and day one and just that, Chris, that opening. That, that opening from, from them was extremely impressive. Yeah, a, a little bit worryingly so, um, because it's definitely a, a new concept of car. It's like speaking to the team, it's it's the same idea of what they're trying to achieve, but just going about it in a different way. And they had a lot to learn about the car. There was so much to understand. So for it to just naturally put in pace that was a second clear than everyone else doing something similar at a similar time, scanning the cars and just going through setups and things, uh, was a little bit ominous, but also the way that how quickly the car just looked settled, that it looked comfortable, and you could see differences between. I mean, you and I stood at turn ten, didn't yeah. we? And accelerating out of there, I think the term you used was fired out of a cannon. Yeah, like, it could be so aggressive <laughs> on the throttle, um, and so much earlier, but so much harsher with it, and just get the drive that it stood out compared to the other cars instantly. So yeah. even though after that, kind of people start doing their own things, it all gets a bit more muddled. It was that initial impression that kind of says this thing is solid all round already so yeah that was that first day is actually the one that is hard to shake how good Red Bull could be from do you think we should be like worried about this for the whole season I remember like if you go back to like last year right and I mean let's be honest it wasn't one of the most exciting years that we've ever had in Formula One no definitely not so I mean now you're coming into this year and we're all we were all like sitting like in the newsroom or in the media center just being like oh my god not another season like this yeah and it's interesting because matters is spot on like that day one was the standout one in terms of like headline times and stuff and actually over the next two days you were kind of like okay well like we haven't actually seen anything outright pace wise that would suggest the rebels that far ahead but when you hear every other rival team talking the way they've been talking uh you just you, you know you form the opinion of, okay, it's going to be a very, very long season for those teams. Because I think one thing we always say, don't we, is that headline times are one thing, mm-hmm. but the body language and the kind of the, the, the stuff that teams are putting out is actually often more telling than anything else that's happening on track. Because it's hard to hide the fact, when you think we could challenge for the championship this year, that's a high thing to fake, especially if you're Charles Leclerc or you're Lando Norris and you're like, this is my first chance to do it it's going to be very difficult to hide that emotion. And n- n- no one other than Max really gave off an air of, you know, supreme confidence in what they've got. So, um, yeah, I think it's just going to be very one-sided. And that is that is the issue, I think, that mm-hmm. gets lost. I think it got lost a little bit with Lewis and Mercedes, is that the Red Bull is incredibly, or looks incredibly good. You put Max in it, and it's just, you know, it's just game over for everyone because he's so confident with it. He's at a level right now that he just seems to keep raising. Mm-hmm. So it is worrying. And the fact that, you know, teams kind of in the launches were saying, we think we can catch, even then they were saying, we're hoping to catch Red Bull by the end of the season. That's before they'd seen what Red Bull had unveiled. And there was kind of per- perhaps an assumption that Red Bull would very much stick with within the concept of last year and the concept everyone was converging around. When they released the car, there was maybe a moment of like, well, I, I remember we were talking about it at the Red Bull launch. It was like very, very revolutionary concept. They might have taken a misstep with this. You know, if you, if you, if you move away from something so good, that, is what day one did. It just made everyone realize like, oh no, okay, it's Adrian Newey's done it again. And so I think that that's, that's why it's difficult to see anything else than, I, I, hopefully it's not 21 wins out of, or 23 wins out of 24 or whatever it would be, but it's really difficult to see anyone else winning on pure merit for a long time. It's like, it's worrying for F1. I mean, we were sitting down at a coffee shop like on whatever it was, uh, day two, I think it was, and we were talking about how, if, you know, we go through another season like last year. I mean, F1 is on this big boom. Right, especially in like North America, and that's obviously a market that they really want to uh, attack and tackle. I mean, at the end of the day, we were discussing like regulations. Like, we have a new regulation change coming in 2026, and if you're going to have a team that's going to absolutely run away with it again for a second straight season, the interest could start to wane, and then you're going to go through another regulation change, which is then going to see another team dominate. Yeah, and, and the narrative coming into this season was that, well, maybe Red Bull are starting to bump up against what's, cap- what's possible within mm-hmm. these regulations, and maybe they'll get to a point of diminishing returns whereby they literally cannot add a huge amount more onto this car. But by making these kind of quite drastic changes to, to what they've done, clearly they've found another avenue of performance. And 
it seems also quite clear that by having such a dominant lead at the start of last year, they were able to shift their development focus very much to this year. And whereas other teams were looking at, you know, a new front wing here or, you know, change to the side pod or suspension there, you know, throughout last year to try and make sure they stay in that very competitive pack behind Red Bull. Red Bull were able to just, you know, tweak a few things, kind of do a few experiments, but nothing drastic on last year's car and put all that development focus into this year's car with something much more kind of dramatic and, and interesting. And it's kind of a little bit like how teams used to operate under the cost cap. You know, they would they would explore several different development paths at once. And uh, so Rebel already had their existing development path they knew was good. But then they started exploring, you know, this obviously slightly more extreme version of, of, of a similar theme. And, uh, and they found a lot of performance. So when you look at it like that, you think... You know, if they if they start the season again, and I think the big question out of testing is, is just how big that advantage is. Yeah. I don't think anybody doubts that they have the advantage. You talk to some people, and it's like, oh well, maybe it's about 0. 0.3, 0. 0.4 seconds. You talk to well, I've heard via you know reports that maybe it's as much as a second. I think that's in the extreme. I don't think that's the case. But um, but even so, 0. 0.3, 0. 0.4 seconds. You know, if they have that over Ferrari, that is a considerable step on where they were at the end of last year, where Ferrari were nipping up their heels, often beating them over a single lap. So, um, yeah, so that is a, that is a concern for, for F1. My, my only hope in all of this is that even if the likes of Ferrari and Mercedes are some way off Red Bull at the start of this year, they've created a better platform for, those, for themselves. They've got rid of some of the issues that they had with their previous cars, and therefore they can now focus more on adding performance to the car within the basic platform that they have, rather than solving the issues that they were just, you know, like basic, uh, you know, driver complaints about the rear end just not being stable going into a corner. If you don't have that, it doesn't matter if you keep putting more downforce on it. If you don't have that stability, uh, you know, and that balance in the car, then you're in big trouble from the start. So that's the only hope in it. But yeah, I, I agree. It's a bit concerning. You know, if, if you look at next year, well, um, everyone's going to want to be working on the 2026 car as soon as they can. So I know they can't do it this year necessarily, but um, because of regulations. But yeah, as soon as they can, that they'll switch and people will start to, you know, right off uh, 2025 as well. Yeah, we were talking about this last night when we were sitting around having a beer. And yeah. it was like... Uh, and and you joked... Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, You joked we should have recorded it. But yeah, we actually, should have. It was a good conversation. I actually thought about uh, it this morning um, and I could remember most of it, you know, just to, you know, just to clarify to everyone listening. Um, but it was so right that you, you pointed out that um, the predictability and Lawrence saying next year, because if you look at it from a North American perspective, and that's where so much attention has gone recently, Sporting culture-wise in America, everybody is geared towards yeah. the, the championship is decided, final race, oh, sorry, final match, yeah. final series, often the final play. And that's where it's kind of weird to look back on Formula 1 because Formula 1 had that in 2021. It kind of had this unusually very, very American season where it was dramatic throughout, it was controversial. It literally did come down to the final race. And I think a lot of fans watched that coming from Drive to Survive and thought, this is like the NFL, this is like baseball basketball and actually you know we've covered it long enough to know that that isn't always the case you know often you get a champion before that and for it to be so extreme now on the other end of that where we're going into the first race i mean fernando alonso saying me and 18 other drivers know max is going to win the championship when you actually step back from the formula one bubble and think about it that is insane you yeah. know imagine imagine you're on before day the super bowl. testing like yeah imagine before the super bowl someone like it's different in the nfl if someone said the chiefs are going to win the super bowl you're like that's a fair bet but there's no guarantee it's going to happen because they have to get there, they have to win it. You know, it's 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 a difference between it being uh, likely or being you know a very very good bet to being inevitable. And I think that is a really difficult sell for Formula One. It's all right to have it to have it once. It's all right to have it twice, maybe. But if we have it again this year and then again, as Lawrence mentioned in 25, it's difficult to see unless someone can really challenge Red Bull. You've kind of got to make that decision early to be like, all right, well. We're not gaining anything long term here. We've got to switch it up. So I think that's a real worry. And I think that that's actually going to be the, the big thing that we're talking about all year is, yeah, what are people, because what is the point for a lot of people to turn on if you know who's going to win, yeah. you know, and, and ultimately that's what drives eyeballs and drives sponsorships, et cetera. So to follow up on what Lawrence said about like developing the cars with Mercedes and Ferrari, Formula One has tried to avoid a situation where those teams who are the ones that could maybe make it more interesting towards the end of the season and into next year, switch completely to the next set of regs because they haven't released the final rules so that teams can't do aero work on them. I believe until the start of next year, I think that's when the, the cutoff is. So through this year, there'll be things they're trying to understand or even do concept work on, but it still really needs money spending on the current cars and next year's car to some extent. Now, in the past, it would have been a case of 
we're not shutting that gap down or if we are we might get close at the end of 25 but that will sacrifice the next era so we're not going to do that we're going to focus on the next era so at least that's been slightly addressed to try and find a way of not having two years written off by teams or, or you know in terms of competitiveness and it also needs saying this is not a complaint against Red Bull or like a dig at Red Bull they've done a brilliant job yeah. and they I think it's actually I felt that more people are kind of yeah downbeat because it looks like it's going to be so dominant as it stands but engineers I mean Andrea Stella saying wow and um, so many different team members going it's actually pretty impressive that they've got something so different that you know no one else is heading that radically in that direction and we're all kind of chasing something and they've moved on again or look like they have and that's on an engineering point of view it is very impressive and you've got to give them credit for that it's just a shame that the byproduct looks like being a lack of competition yeah because then you look at i mean it's, it's like you said if, if, if teams are going to shut down production and focus on 2026 developments in 2025 then what's the point because you're just going to have another dominant car another dominant team you're going to have no one chasing them mm. and then what's your end product like yeah I think the worst thing that could happen here as well is, let's say Max and Red Bull dominate the next two years. If we get to 2026 and, you know, it's difficult to predict when there's a... But why if Red Bull just happened to dominate again? I mean, maybe it's less likely. But you suddenly have a situation where you're like, all right, well, we changed all this. Yeah. And now their new advantage yeah. is locked, is, 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 you know, they're back at a point where they're, they're here, their ceiling's up here and everyone else is chasing them. Or it could just be another team. And that's fun for a year. You know, if it's Ferrari, I think people will be like, oh, that's great. Yep. But very quickly, it's like, okay, well, they're dominating now. So I think there's a deeper problem than just, like Matt has said, it being Red Bull now. I think Formula One, and, and it is the way Formula One's always been. Mm -hmm. But if you're selling a sport in the modern era, mm -hmm. going up against what you're going against, it just, you know, it, it just isn't perfect. And I don't know what the solution is to it either, but it, it's something you become more and more aware of the more it happens. And there's going to be dominant eras throughout Formula One the way it is. It's just, it's worrying to, to, I don't know, to, see how formula one can kind of keep on selling it if that's the case i don't know i'm not, I'm not saying we're, we're never people aren't all going to stop watching formula one but this boom we're having right now you're very conscious yeah. of how long that can go on for and you want to keep well, them around yeah 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 i mean a lot of pressure on sergio perez as well to make, yeah to, to yeah save and poor parents without alonso alonso is not not yeah, part of the right, sergio right, perez quote i mean um, yeah yeah uh, and but you know i do think realistically how good max is in that car and how comfortable yeah. he is within that team uh perez has got challenge that he's probably not not up to uh this and it year. probably explains and why what we saw last year as a case but then you know his, his seat is also open going into uh 2025 and it'll be interesting to see uh what what red will do with that whether they're just happy with the status quo winning championships keeping max happy or whether they also realize that you know because they're a big brand within the sport they've invested a huge amount in it maybe they'll look to in, inject some excitement in it not the way red bulls worked historically but you never know you know these things do change what do we see from uh, Ferrari and Mercedes? Because I think Charles Leclerc had a pretty decent long run on at the, towards the end of day three. I believe he was on the C1 tire, but race pace for him looked pretty good, actually. Like, stronger than, obviously, last year. Yeah, Fred Vasseur was very uh, positive about it. And actually, I think both drivers were, too, that they'd made strides with looking after their tires a bit more. The wind sensitivity was something they really wanted to fix yeah. compared to last year's car. And I didn't get a f clear steer if they were happy with what they'd done there a lot like very happy but they seem to be much happier with long run pace in terms of yeah the way they were working the tire and the control of it because i think there was quite a big drop off still compared to red bull over a long run but then you don't know if that's because they're going okay where's our limit mm -hmm. yeah we're trying to work out what we do with the car that is the point of testing is you you understand what you can and can't get away with uh, so I, they the fact that they said they were happier a lot happier uh, i think was a, a good sign and uh, I actually spoke to Carlos Sainz on Tuesday and he was talking about headline lap times and he's like, we'll be quick. Like, no one should be surprised that the Ferrari over one lap will be quick in the sense that I actually think come qualifying, it'll be way more be competitive closer, yeah. than the way we talk right now. Because it yeah. was even last year, I seem to think, that we were kind of expecting this huge margin and then he's suddenly like, oh, it's actually a bit closer, but Red Bull's advantage was always yeah. in the race. And that's what Ferrari expecting again. They, they beat Red Bull more often than not to pole position in the second half of last year. In, in one lap raw pace, that car was comfortably quick enough. It's just it couldn't turn that into race performance. And that's what they were trying to address. And they seem happy with, but as we've mentioned, Red Bull just seemed to have then moved the goalposts yeah. further on. But if you compare to where they were 12 months ago, I remember looking at the long runs of the Ferrari uh, yeah, at the end of the test last year and you were like, 
this this can't be right. They must mm. be like there must be something fundamentally wrong here, or like what was going on with the track conditions because the drop off was just so dramatic. And uh, Fred was asked about that, and his response at that time he was very new in the job at that point, but he was basically saying, well, if you've got a fast car over one lap, it's really just setup issues that then kind of put you in a position where you can then look after the tires and translate that into race pace. And it proved to be much more difficult than that. But yeah, the, the indications from yeah the, the long run that Charles did also there was a good one that uh, Carlos did on day two. Uh, com- very favorably to Perez who was out uh, uh, well not the same time but he was also out on a um, on a long run uh, kind of race simulation style run uh, the same day and Carlos looked you know better uh, but you know I, I think there were um, probably some issues going on some other contributing factors um, you kind of take it with a pinch of salt a bit but yeah the, the Ferrari does look like it's a considerable step forward compared to what it was with looking after tires last year and that is key. Yeah, Nate, I mean, it's impressive to see that, you know, on a track like here in Bahrain where the asphalt is pretty abrasive and you see that, you know, how competitive they were on a long run and a C1 tire gives you a bit of hope for the Grand Prix, doesn't it? I mean, yeah. I think I, it does for me. Like, because when I see that, I'm, I'm looking at like where they were last season, how much they've struggled with race pace. And then you see how the jump or the step that they've taken with their car this year. Yeah, and Charles said last year was the worst test he'd ever had in yeah. Formula One. So, and then I don't think he said it, this was the best one, but it, it seemed like such a contrast to that. So, yeah, I just echo what these two guys said. I mean, the 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 biggest feedback was those two guys have a car they know they can drive. It's not as erratic as it was last year. I think that's going to make a huge difference. So, and again, it just comes. I I was just going to make the joke when Lawrence was talking. Like, I think. Red Bull is beatable this year. It's just the one that per- Perez is in. You know, I think when you look at it like that, that ultimately will be the thing this year. And again, just to go back to quotes of people kind of dis- <laughs> um, kind of dissing Perez a bit. Um, I think it was yesterday. Fred said, and he was talking about how close that gap is behind with Ferrari, Aston, McLaren, Mercedes. Uh, 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 sorry, yeah, Mercedes. And he said, ten kilograms of fuel if you add in the car. That's the difference between second and seventh. So he was. Yeah, he was saying Max is out in front. Perez might still, you know, still be in there. I, I think he was talking about the team. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 But, but when you but when you read yeah. it when you read it on the surface, you're like, hang on a sec. And then you and Lawrence clarified that to me when we were writing it. Um, but yeah, I, I think Ferrari are going to be in a much better step. It's just again, it's just where is that relative to uh, to the guy? Yeah, there's a little bit to be said as well that yeah, as we talk about this, Red Bull have not said anything of oh, the Ferrari looks really strong, or so-and-so looked like they could challenge us, which is what's the most telling. But while we talk about what Red Bull hinted at with day one, and what you then get the feeling and think is in there, and then everyone talks about, and they're hiding pace, you don't know how much they're hiding, so does everyone else. Yeah. Like Ferrari won't have gone, okay, we'll see how far off we are with a, a performance run that's at the absolute limit. Every team has something, yeah. and it's who's got the most that they're going to show. And if, if Red Bull have hidden the most or have the most potential, then the gap will be bigger. But if actually Ferrari, with that comfort, and as Lawrence says as well, the start point being stronger, uh, are able to be more consistent over a race run, and they're close in qualifying, then that could mean that there's certain races where they are actually genuinely yeah. like race-winning material. Yeah. So you, you, there are those unknowns still, as much as we talk it down. Yeah. Yeah, but, remember, like sample of three days at one track, mm. quite an unusual track, quite an unusual track surface, you know, power-dependent track, all of those things change as you move around the calendar. Yeah. So, yeah, the picture does, does change. I think it's interesting to see how many teams have shown up this year with different platforms. And I think that's such a big talking point simply because, you know, for those listening or watching, I mean, when you look at the cars, they may uh, <laughs> they may not. You wave away, buddy. Wave away. Uh, I mean, when you look at the cars, right, like when you look at them on TV, everybody kind of looks similar. I mean, obviously, the RB20 looks a little bit different. But when you see these cars up close and personal, there are fine details where you're looking at them and you can start to see, okay, this is different from this one. This one's different from this one. This one's different. And they all have their own tiny little concepts. But one of the key things that I was looking at for the past three days was, you know, different platforms that some of these teams have shown up with, you know, in particular Mercedes with the W15 It has a lot of interesting packaging on it. I think they've done something a little bit different, obviously with that entire car where, I think they've got something. I don't know what it is just yet, but I feel like it's a platform that they can build upon. And that's something that the drivers talked about, especially Lewis and George. I mean, they felt, or they seemed, very confident about what they had. It was just trying to uh, build upon that base. And with this regulation, you know, that's what I look at, is, is building upon the bases that they've shown up with and taking that direction that, Lawrence, you did mention, you know, like that aero direction. I think when we look at the W15, I mean, and Lewis leaving, and like, there's just there's so many stories there, guys. Like, it's just if if they show up and you know Friday qualifying doesn't go well, 
I mean, Chris, what do you like? What do you think? What do you think Lewis is thinking at that point? Like, weirdly, I think he's in a better place than he was twelve months ago. Like, if you heard the quotes coming out of Mercedes twelve months ago, very quickly they went to doom and gloom. They, they were like, "Yeah, we've got this totally wrong again. This is this. We've got to fix it. Totally, like we've got to give them something better." Now, some of that I think came out over the race weekend in Bahrain. Yeah. But even the drivers during the test, they were almost like resigned to that. You know, oh, you know, we're not anywhere. We're not on Red Bull's level. We're not close to it. We've still got problems. This week, as you say, so much more positivity about the car they have themselves. And that led to them not really going, oh, but it's terrible where Red Bull is or that we've done a bad job compared to Red Bull. They actually went, we've done a good job from what we were trying to do. So, okay, frustratingly, I think George said Red Bull are in the distance. But he kind of said it in passing of, but we've got a much more drivable car, a car we're happier with. It's much better. Lewis said the same thing. And I don't think he's afraid to speak his mind if it hadn't, especially because of the feedback he was giving yeah. what he wanted from the car. And he felt he didn't get that last year. So I think he's more positive, actually. And I think, it, as Lawrence alluded to earlier, if it gives them a, a starting point that is better to be able to develop the car rather than just try and resolve issues with the car like they had the last two seasons, then it's just a more positive like, kind of outlook for the whole year for that team, even if it's still behind Red Bull. Mm -hmm. So um, I I'm with you as well. I don't think we really saw, that's the one team where I thought I didn't yeah. really see a hint, yeah. but it wasn't that I'd seen anything negative that made me worry yeah. for them. Just thought, okay, they've, they've not shown us totally or, or something yeah. that says, okay, it might put them around here. So I, I think they're probably the biggest question mark of front five for me as in behind well yeah. front four behind red bull yeah, yeah i agree and it's also because a lot of the stuff they did was out of sync with everyone else so they were just doing a lot of kind of like basically you know different setup choices scan the car like way longer than everyone else but sometimes you might be concerned about that you mm. might think oh well they really are lost but it didn't feel like that you know when they put the car down at the end of uh the final day of the test you know george was able to get a you know, a kind of testing lap that you would expect out of a pretty solid car yeah. uh, that left him second over on the C4 tyres. So, yeah, I, I feel like there's there's enough there. And you got to remember last year as well, they, they kind of got everything, you know, wrong. They, they they went way too conservative with where they were looking for downforce. They were running a, a ride height because they thought everybody else was going to lift their ride height as well uh, due to the change in, in, in the regs that just didn't work out for them. So now, um, basically from the Monaco Grand Prix onwards, that was when they completely changed the front suspension, changed the floor, changed where they were looking for downforce. And from there, they've been pushing. But the big thing they weren't able to change last year was the rear suspension, which, as you mentioned, they've, uh, you know, they've done quite a radical change there. Um, you know, they've gone from pull rod to push rod, but um, it's clearly quite a, quite a neat little package at the back there. And Aston Martin were talking about it as well, how happy they are taking that suspension from, from Mercedes going into this year. So it feels like some of, yeah, just the fundamental blocks to build the performance on are there this year and they definitely were not at this time last year nate mclaren i mean also looking interesting i mean chris and i were out at uh turn turn 10 in the exit you know the red bull was impressive but actually you know the mclaren was solid like i think they've shown up with just a, a solid car that they can they can you know battle with for first few races of the season now it, it was interesting like when you heard andre Sella talking about their development plan because you know, you would expect McLaren to arrive for Bahrain, like ready to go, all the new bits and pieces on it, but it sounds like it's going to take some time to develop again. Yeah, I think that speaks to how well last year went doing that as well. Um, but again, they're, they're another team like Ferrari. Obviously, 12 months ago, they were one of the big stories of just how badly that was all going. Um, and yeah, I think it's funny because McLaren, out of all of the teams, even Red Bull, coming into this, this preseason, I was really excited to see because you can notice it that the the uh, morale at that team has completely changed you know there was a real optimism at the launch and you know there's just a real feeling that you know i mean zach brown even last year was saying i think 2025 we can be you know outright contenders but you did feel like oh maybe 24 is a year they can get themselves into that mix but i think you're completely right i think they've got a solid car i think the upgrade i think basically everything that andreas has done, has done so far has seemed to work at least from you know from the outside and that's what you're hearing from zach brown so i think that you know, whatever the path is that he's laid out, I think is going to be their best one forward because he hasn't put a foot wrong yet. And they're not having to deal with, for the, what was it last year? It was Austria, wasn't it? The first upgrade. So they had like seven, eight races where they were just basically treading water and basically desperately convincing Lando, like, hey, man, just please just hang on. Hang on, man, it'll be fine. Uh, and they would have to do that this year. And I think that's going to take a lot of pressure away from them just externally. But I actually think McLaren, that, that's what's fascinating about that pack behind is you know, a one driver mistake, one one slight 
kind of directional mistake in terms of setup, and you could cost yourself from maybe a spot on the front row to you know third or fourth row if it is that close. Um, and they just all seem to be in that, 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 that. I don't. Maybe you guys can remember a different one. But I can't remember a time when there's been so many cars where you really haven't been able to separate them that clearly. I remember you were talking about your order, yeah. and you were kind of like, hey, do you think McLaren's there? I was like, McLaren could be there, or they could be like three <laughs> steps above it. You know, like, you just don't know. So, uh, yeah, I think McLaren's in a good spot. And it's nice to see because Bahrain has always been a place they've struggled as well. Mm. So, um, so I think as well that they're always conscious of that fact uh, at this point. Those, those last two years is a thing to remember. Like, when it came to testing both times, they were awful. Yeah. in this era like, they were so like, far off the right like, there was parts falling off the car oh, yeah. and yeah <laughs> la- they weren't getting running in like last year they were nowhere and it's funny you mentioned it I did forget that genuinely there were questions of will Norris yeah. stick around because this team is, yep. is a shambles right now mm. and the team they were so confident like Zach Brown in Bahrain said I want to end the year with the fourth fastest car like only behind Red Bull, yeah. um, Mercedes and Ferrari. Um, he's like, yeah, we might have given ourselves too much to do in terms of points because we're going to be so far behind by the time we get the car somewhere good. But I want to end the year with the fourth fastest car. Not, they comfortably finished fourth and at times with the second fastest car and yeah. damn close in places to Red Bull. Sure, yeah, yeah, like so I think that turnaround was impressive, but also shows because of that and because of what we talk about Red Bull, you, it's easy to go like, oh, others haven't done quite as good a job or we'll be disappointed. Some of them have made really good strides within their own kind of isolated bubble. It's yeah. just that we have to then put them all together at some point to go racing. <laughs> and that's when you see where they actually stack up. Uh, OK, so I got to this is from Adam Wilde. So Adam is a uh, Adam is the is the co-host on this show. Well, where is he? He wants to know. Uh, he, he wants to know from you guys. We'll start. Lawrence, we'll start with you. Uh, he wants to know what your prediction for the biggest surprise this season. Uh, so driver and team. Go put me on the spot. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you Although look bored, take, dude. You look yeah. bored sitting over there. I think it'd be something to no. do. He's a joint views. Yeah, yeah. Actually, yeah, it's, 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 it's quite nice of you. Actually, um, but it's not helping me uh, pick biggest surprise. Um, I mean, it's funny, isn't it? Because we got we got the same drivers that we had last year in, yeah. in all the same teams. So, yeah. like, you kind of know roughly uh, what you're going to get. But I think we'll see... I don't know if this is a surprise, but it might be to people who weren't paying too much attention to the end of last year, is the newly renamed Visa Cash App RB. Right. I don't know how you would like me to refer to them, Tim, but I'll go with RB <laughs> for now. Um, I think they're, they're looking pretty solid. So uh, uh, there's this kind of general assumption, which I think is, is fair, that you've got, you know, five teams. Uh, you've got Red Bull a long way ahead, and then you've got your group of four, Ferrari, Mercedes, McLaren, Aston Martin together. I actually think on occasion, uh, RB might be uh, nipping on the heels of that. And um, and I think, you know, sticking with that theme, a driver who impressed me massively last year, but perhaps flew under the radar a bit because the car wasn't very good for a lot of it, was, was Yuki. And uh, so, yeah. Um, yeah, put on the spot, uh, and these guys will probably say something in a minute. I'll be like, oh, that's the obvious one. <laughs> Put on the spot, that's what I'm going to go with. No, that's the opposite, because you, t- you stole the team, I was going to say. Um, and Yuki's a really good shout, because last year with the, he had three different teammates, so the story was always about what was going on at the team. Um, I, I, I'm actually going to echo RB. I think that um, that storyline is, you know, obviously we've mentioned Zach Brown's name a few times, but he's every time he's got a mic in his hand at the moment, he's basically bringing up that relationship between the two. And I think that um, and I was down at a session with uh, Peter Bayer and uh, Laura Meckes, um on you know, yesterday, and that was the like one of the main topics there. And I think that the more successful they are this season, that that topic just gets louder and louder. And they should be better. Like they they're coming from a, a low place last year, but they've got all that investment. Red Bull's clearly changing the way they're thinking about that team and actually in that midfield there are you know there are positions to gain so i think they're actually going to move up the up the order quite quickly and drive i stretched that answer out a bit like christian horner filibusting so i could come up with a driver uh that's a surprise i don't know if it counts as a surprise but i think someone who i think has just got breakout year written all over him and he he did have a good season last year but i think piastri is gonna have you're right he's gonna take one is it Pi- yeah, piastri? Yeah, yeah yeah piastri i just think is um he he has been so impressive and maybe it's a cop-out because he did impress last season mm-hmm. he had that sprint win mm-hmm. um but given everything we've talked about and given where mclaren could be in that pack i think for all of the doom and gloom i gave out earlier i think the big thing about this year is when you have a dominant team out in front if there's only really one team that's in a position to capitalize if that team slips up it doesn't always work out that team might also make a mistake in that race if you've got four teams that are all there and they're all fighting closely together and something happens to Max, you've got a real, you've got a real chance of something happening uh, out in front. And I think Piastri is 
the guy at McLaren who doesn't have the pressure on him. I think Lando is the guy that needs to win this year. Obviously, every driver wants to win. But, but he doesn't Lando, even have a win. Like it, yeah, right. And like Oscar does. Like well, and I think yeah. he shares the record, Lando, with Nick Heidfeld for the most podiums without a win. Which is, you know, which stats like that, like drivers say they don't care about them, but it's got to weigh on your mind. Piastri doesn't have any of that, and he's been so impressive. I think if he gets that first win, that storyline alone is really fascinating. But yeah, I, I, I'm gonna, my surprise would be I think Piastri wins a race this year at some point. Sorry, Meadows, but that's my. Why? <laughs> I think so. I think that we're talking later in the year, yeah. but I think that there will be opportunities for people to do yeah, it. I and I think ultimately the championship is long gone, but I think that Piastri is the sort of guy that I think in that moment would, would step up and, and get there. Fair enough. So, yeah, I was going to go with PS3. Um, not to win, though. So. No, 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 maybe wouldn't have made such a, a bold <laughs> statement. And I'll, I'll actually stick with that rather than trying to go for something that's kind of like weaker because if I'd have gone for a second, well, I, it probably would have been Yuki. And I think it's, I think it's yeah. Yuki, so, so, um, so based on that, yeah, I'd, I'd go Oscar as well. And I think, I don't think he needs to beat Lando. I don't, I don't really know if he'd actually get better results than Lando, but I do think that what we've seen with him and his growth, yeah. like through junior categories as well, how quickly he's moved up, but how quickly he adapts and learns. I think, as Nate says, breakout year is a really good term in the sense of, I think what he didn't have last year was consistency, but he went to some tracks he didn't know. McLaren was a bit up and down. He's got a more stable car. He's got the experience. I, and the reason I then say that he's the, su the surprise, if we're saying a surprise, and I know I agree that maybe not so surprising given some of the stuff he did last year, but it's that if he doesn't kick on, that's unexpected. I yeah. think everyone has such high expectations yeah. of him and belief yeah. in him that that would be unexpected. So it's a surprise more if yeah. that doesn't happen. But for the team, I did actually have one lined up that's not been said. <laughs> and it's very underwhelming in some ways. But Haas, I spoke to them a couple of times over the weekend. And you know how they came into it and they were like, we are going to be nowhere basically this year we're going to be off the back like we're going to start at the back but all we want to do is show a little bit of progress a little bit of improvement but you know don't expect anything by the end of the weekend they're like this is nowhere near as bad as we thought it'd be like we might even be competitive with a few teams <laughs> and genuinely i went in there being like this is surprising like, it's the, after gunther steiner you thought it could be an interesting atmosphere very positive everyone seemed happy with the way they worked they have changed kind of some methods and stuff Ayo Komatsu seems to actually have been really uh, impressing the people he needs to impress within that team and yeah. getting them behind him uh, and I just think it's a lot more stable and happy than I expected it to be it looks like that car looks like an old uh, like last year's Aston Martin yeah like it, it looks they, just like it they've they seem very happy with they've created something that should be much better in races yeah it's still gonna be the slowest car yeah but there's gonna be some races where if you think how quick it was over one lap at times last year they can lose some of that they can slip back a bit but if they're make a step in the race they will beat some teams so that that actually surprised me i wasn't expecting that at all and, and remember how much of that car is underpinned by for ferrari's Ferrari, engine yeah. ferrari parts yeah. and obviously ferrari making big steps with uh you know with with their tire degradation their race performance some of that is going to rub off on on uh Hass, and especially if they get a sensible aero package there you know something that isn't the completely wrong direction like they seem to find in austin last year yeah then yeah that is a that is a good step for well that's one of their that was one of their key issues right was was racing last year i mean qualifying they were well hulkenberg was really strong in some cases magnuson was too but yeah that was their key issue wasn't it just race race pace yeah i'm not saying you're going to see Haas in q3 and yeah. scoring points i'm just saying that the way they talked it down i think that everyone expected you know they finished last last year they looked bad at some races <laughs> last year as well that yes, it's going better <laughs> but, it was, yeah, just, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but it was your, uh, yeah. what i'm saying <laughs> yes he says oscar wins i say Nico. no um but it was i just saw your faces as i started to answer and i was like no let, let, let hear me out and I, i'm hoping i convinced everyone there they're not basically not as bad as i thought they'd be i think so how else, bad did you think yeah, they were gonna be? <laughs> so, clearly 10th not really yeah. racing anyone so they, they they are the be well, they in their, in clearly 10th aren't they they were literally like we're yeah. going to be last for the foreseeable yeah, yeah. so yeah i think that that oh, i think there's gonna be races they're not um and that very much if when they are that they're not you know embarrassing off the back or anything which these regs I, do help avoid. i was i was talking to uh one of the one of the mechanics in the paddock uh day three and i was saying you know how do you see this and he was like you know red bull gap you know ferrari mclaren mercedes aston martin etc then a huge gap and then he kept going like this <laughs> he kept going like this he's like haas <laughs> uh, i was like oh. wow well then i may well be proven wrong but that's yeah. right because no one ever remembers this stuff right guys yeah <laughs> we do have it on recording but well flip, flip side is <laughs> too, too, too it's also so I want it to go something positive because the other team I don't know you're going to pick one oh yeah oh go on go ahead then no 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 conti something. continue I was going to say could be, 
slightly potential worrying one with Alpine. Yeah, I was yeah. It just didn't look good, but they, no. they rarely look good. Yeah. So it is an unknown. That's, that's what, that's what yeah. Morris... Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so in pre-season. In pre-season. <laughs> that's our tagline. Yeah. Uh, and we're not talking about the livery, either, are we? Um, no. so, yeah, I, 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 that's I, another I, thing. You noticed they yeah, added more blue. Thing. He's delighted they, 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 they did add more blue. I mean, yeah, they were very... Actually, I didn't like Yeah, on the, on the nose. nose. They used to be just like the outline of blue, and then they kind of made the... They kind of got got the, uh, the, the, the the Microsoft Paint tool out of, uh, yeah. of like fill, and That's they've just filled that. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Well, well, I, I, and also, well, if you stand by it, we're going to make you do it at some point. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, Nate's livery um, <laughs> in Microsoft Paint. In Microsoft Paint. Microsoft Paint. Um, I look paint, forward to paint that. Nate, Nate. <laughs> Nate, Nate Paint. Nate Paint. <laughs> <laughs> that's actually something you were saying though with Alpine you and I were talking about it yeah. yesterday it was like they, they tend to not so, go well in testing that's right I mean I always do these you know rundown I'm working on it right now um, once I finish this podcast on, on, on who, who who's placed where and almost every year I put Alpine down I'm like yeah the, you know terrible start to the year and all that but they just seem to have a different way of going testing whether I mean almost certainly that's a, in, in the case of carrying more fuel a lot of the time yeah. but also they seem to work through harder compound tyres if you look at their compound choices going into this test they didn't have any C4 and C5 which of course C4 was the tyre that most people were getting the most uh fast laps out of and then they had a huge amount of c1s so you know for whatever reason at this track they feel the way they learn the most about their car is on the c1 and um yeah i'm not entirely sure for the reasons and that but that will inevitably result in uh, what look like slower lap times but once you correct for the tires probably not that bad i'm going with uh lewis hamilton oh, yeah. finally getting back onto right. the top step yeah, yeah, yeah. it's yeah. been 2021 saudi arabia yeah yeah, yeah that's right yeah. Yeah. So that's what that's what I'm going. I thought you guys would be more jacked up over that, man. Nah, no, you're all British. Well, well, we're not allowed to be. We're not allowed to talk about Lewis Hamilton. People go, "You just love Lewis because you're British." It's like, oh, I can't talk about the guy. Yeah. You know. Um, Once we finish the pub, we can go dancing down. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, no, I, I, I really, I, I'm really into the Lewis story this yeah, year, sure. and I think that, and either way, it's going to be really cool. But I actually, I actually think that from a Formula One fan perspective, seeing Lewis win at least once more with Mercedes would just be really like a really great way to end that story it's the greatest partnership yeah. ever of a team and driver and lewis that's lewis is awesome like just just unbelievable and yeah to finish that on a it, it, it would be great for us as journalists if it finished on a sour note in a way like just to get into that story but for that team of what they achieved and the legacy of it you know it deserves it deserves one final moment where they can kind of celebrate him and he can celebrate being with the team and all that stuff i mean i think it'd be great for us journalists if it ended with another final race shootout for the title that, yeah. between him and the staff well, ima imagine it, yeah, ima imagine if he like wins the final five races then goes off to ferrari and everyone's like well lewis i think yeah. you've done i saw there was a great clip going around of um lewis on day one taking pictures of the side of the Mercedes car, like zooming in with his phone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was, I, was, I was like, if I was Terry Wolf, I'd be like, you give me that phone right now. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. You know, see, they've got WhatsApp partnership, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm doing some partnership work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, on his steering wheel in the, in the car, yeah. Anyway, we're letting him more time to do this. No, this is great. No, uh, so we got some questions. Hey, what's I, your team? team? I did. I said, oh, sorry, Mercedes, yeah. Because yeah. oh, okay. Mercedes so and, yeah, that's what I think is going to be the most even though I have them, so, so you did this for TSN and Sports Center, but like I got them the Ugh. fourth, yeah, the fourth <laughs> fastest team on the grid, starting off, Ooh. starting off. So, behind behind so you think there's yeah, big Ferrari? I, I put McLaren behind uh, Red Bull. You put them ahead of yeah, Ferrari. Yeah, I put McLaren up high. So do you think Aston are behind Mercedes yeah, now? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Just after you and I went down to talk to Mike Crack and Dan Fellow, Dan mm. Fellows, uh, yesterday, uh, that's when I was like. Go backwards. Uh, I'm like, <laughs> well, I'm like, it doesn't like. Okay, so for at, we're getting off topic, but it's all right. So for Aston Martin, I don't know. When I look at it, I think they are hiding something. Obviously, everybody is, but I don't think it's big enough to to get back to where they were last year in terms of that shock performance mm. from the team in the opening round. Yeah, but, well, I don't think Aston are in a bad place. It's just no, that everybody else has done a proper job this yeah. year. So, so where you know they've taken a, a step. A, a, Aston relative to the Red Bull yeah. at this time of year. Probably not a million miles away from yeah. where they were last year, but that gap has been filled in. But um, yeah, I'm really struggling between whether I put McLaren or Aston Martin further ahead, and I've got Ferrari second and Mercedes third. So, uh, so I think I get Ferrari 
maybe McLaren had a Mercedes. Really? I think they had a bit of a disjointed test still, didn't they? Like, they did, yeah, yeah. That could be a problem, but also maybe And I'm not sure bit. there was that much that really, I don't know, correct me if I'm wrong, or let me know because I'm about to go downstairs yeah. and write it, but um, <laughs> tell, me, tell me what it was that made McLaren so compelling. I think, well, it's a bit like we said that Mercedes didn't show certain things. Yes, I think there was yeah. just a few moments or like a few runs, yeah, watching McLaren yeah. coming out of certain corners. And yeah. You're like, yeah, I think okay. it was pretty good. Yeah. And, and again, you get that as an, in, uh, an impression, but it could yes. be actually on a lap that, was terrible somewhere else that you didn't see and then yeah you, you've got a yeah. misconception but um one other thing quickly then yeah that shows how it's important when you speak to people and gain that kind of knowledge that's what gives you a feel of okay the way they're saying that or, or this warning or that issue they're dealing with that doesn't appear on a lap time that comes from them telling you it and then you go okay and you piece it all together teams do this yeah. like the amount of times teams actually then say like what you're hearing or we'll speak to journalists during a week because they're trying to find out what other teams are saying that they can then piece together a bit of a picture from as well. It's quite interesting. So obviously if you're stood in two different rival team kits and you go, so, how you doing? They're not going to go, uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Like They're not going to give anything away. But Aston was another one. You said about concepts and cars and details. Yeah. We went into the pit lane, didn't we, uh, day three morning, walked down, and it, it was Red Bull that had said, that's a really well-developed car, the Aston. They, they were quite impressed with it. And then... We can see that from watching it trackside because mm -hmm. you can't get that close to it. Mm -hmm. And then you see it in the garage, and Lawrence was like, mm -hmm. "Actually, yeah." Like you, and it's only when you get up close, mm -hmm. like you say. So sorry for everyone who doesn't get to get up close to them, but but we get to relay that. Yeah, part of the job, right? Mm. We got some questions. Uh, I'm gonna start with Nate because actually this question is directed to <laughs> straight towards him. Oh, wow. It's from uh, it's from Meredith. Uh, she wants to know. Okay, she goes, she asks, "Does Nate know he's the president of Rick Nation?" I, I well, I, 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 I didn't know I had an official title, but on Twitter I do get occasionally get called the Ricardo Whisperer by a, f a few people. So I did have an idea. Hell of a mental image, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, which I can confirm I'm not. I, I don't, I don't mean him. Don't speak telepathically, um, but I'll take it. I mean, I don't think I don't know if I am. I think maybe there's a few people. Meadows is Meadows is you know up in the. Up in the running as well. No, no, vice, president. vice president. Yeah, yeah. It's Saunders Medland on the on the election campaign. Please <laughs> do. Um, <laughs> but no, well, well, no, thanks to thanks to Meredith for that. Um, I do. I mean, last year with Ricardo, I have to say, and this is this this is, um, is plugging Medland's work. When Meadows reported Ricardo's replacing, I was we were like chasing it, and I was probably you know. Like, like sometimes, sometimes as a journalist, you're just behind someone else getting the story. People were tweeting me and be like, "Is Chris true?" And I was like, "I believe so." Yeah, yeah. I think, yeah. <laughs> I think, yeah. I think, yeah. It seems so. It seems so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it was, but it was funny. So like, I, I can't claim to be the only person that knows anything about him. But president, what was it? President of Rick Nation. I'll take it. That's that's a T-shirt. Went into having like, change the cap for you. Rick Nation. Where was it? Was Vegas? You and him. Drove through the desert, or well, we drove through the desert, and we also flew there in a jet, in a PJ. So <laughs> in a PJ, I really, I loves, remember that. Loves the I PJ part. Lawrence was telling me that you were. He's like, he's. I'm like, where's Nate? He's like, you were like, oh, he's just on a private jet with Daniel mm -hmm. Ricardo. I'm like, yeah, yeah you're. Which I have to clarify for people listening is not a normal occurrence. <laughs> it, it, like, like, just so people listening are like, who is this guy? Uh, uh, we were going. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but I'm the pre I'm the president. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, um, just for people listening, so they don't think I live some decadent lifestyle or at least more decadent lifestyle than uh than needs needs to be we were going to drive up there and then red bull said why don't you just hop on the private jet with them and you're not going to turn that down right so uh from at carolina underscore f1 asks i know we only had three days of testing but if you had to do a pecking order what would it be i'll start with uh I'll start with you, Chris, and then we'll go around. Well, I heard Carolina, and I thought it was going to be Panthers related, and I was like, here we go, and I was like, oh, yeah. no. It's just, um, so it's Kansas City. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> a lot easier. Uh, shock Red Bull at the top, Ferrari second. Yeah, I'll, I'll go with McLaren third, Mercedes fourth. How are we saying this as well? Because it's... Yeah, go one to ten. Well, yeah, but this is partly from where we look now. Yes. Kind of, this will fluctuate a lot during the season at different yeah, well, tracks, but I kind of think now. if I had to bet on the final order as well, this is how I'm doing it. Yeah. Um, so it's kind of like the picture it's given us. So yeah, Mercedes fourth, Aston fifth. Uh, ooh, yeah, Visa Cash App RB getting the full name sixth. I'll go, I'll go Alpine seventh because it's an unknown, but I feel like they should be better than that. Uh, Didn't pay enough attention to these bottom three, and I'm actually doing this bit more gut feel. Stake eighth, Salva. Williams ninth, Haas tenth. Oh, wow. 
Williams. Well, Williams down. Yeah, yeah, but the thing is as well, this is all so close. Yeah. Like even from second to tenth, well, yeah, it's not and Haas. Four seconds. Yeah. No, and like, Haas, I think again, you still say will be tenth. Just maybe I don't think it's far off everyone, but maybe then ninth to second. Genuinely, there will be times that that Ferrari are paying attention to what Williams do in qualifying because they can beat them and that sort of thing, or get you know troublesome for them in Q1 and Q2. So uh, it's yeah, really tight. All of that big caveat yeah. yeah and this is actually <clears throat> if you are making a final season prediction which is what you're doing there that's when you consider the drivers as well and i think if you know you look at that so i would i would actually agree with your your top five was red bull ferrari mclaren mercedes aston yeah you and i know sorry to say this to you tim and to a lot of your listeners but if aston had two stronger drivers i would think they might be up there given the car they have but we saw last year there's only one of those drivers that was really scoring good points um, I th- I, I'm, I'm in on the, the V crab, the V carb hype, whatever we're calling it. I, I was calling them V crab. For, yeah, for people that, yeah, with a B, yeah, like a crab, like a crab on the beach, just for anyone uh, who misheard that. Um, I, I'm buying into that, and I think over the course of the year, and I agree with what Lawrence said earlier, Yuki had an amazing season last year, you know, career wise for him. And I think Ricardo's back in a pretty good place, you know, and I think that together, that's a pretty solid driver lineup. Um, I'd like to think Williams are higher than what Meta said, but I'm also the same. I didn't pay super close attention. Alpine surely can't be further down than that, given where they were last year. But like again, it's you have to caveat it with they always start badly. But I feel like you've probably got like Williams and Alpine are there, and then pick one. I'm going to, uh, I'll put my neck on the line. So Williams, then Alpine. That's that's a big shout. Actually, wait, actually wait, actually wait. That goes against what I said because Logie Sarge, I don't think. So I'll put Alpine above. Williams for that reason because they've not got two cars consistently scoring good points and then stake and then house have I missed the team out? I feel like I missed the team out I just I just talked about it for longer basically (laughs) sorry yeah yeah Right, okay, so we're doing what we think is going to be at the end of the season. No, is I'm that like, what this has morphed into? I, I, that's how we've done it. I, yeah, so... Okay, well, I, I, I'll talk about it as, as, as I go through and yeah. kind of explain yeah. where I think things will... Things will... No, no. Yeah, 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 this is so much gut feeling. So much gut feeling. After dark. Um, <laughs> so, Salva first. No, of course. Red, <laughs> <laughs> Red Bull first. And then that gap uh, is, is kind of unknown. But the, but the block of teams behind that is incredibly tight. So at the moment, I think it is uh, Ferrari, Mercedes, and then I can't pick between McLaren and Aston Martin, but probably McLaren ahead. Again, I haven't seen this this special lap that everyone keeps referring <laughs> yes. to that, that means that they're going to... Um, but by the end of the year, I, I actually could see a situation where uh, Mercedes overtake overtake Ferrari uh, and get up mm. into second place. Um, Lewis I think... Do about well, I mean, in, in this year, he starts... Uh, yeah, well, I mean, but what about Carlos? If yeah, you know, he's going yeah, somewhere yeah. else, he might, you know... It, no, but I, I, that's that's not the way... Like drivers tend to work. No, you go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so like, Ferrari, after you. Yeah. Then. Can I ask on that point, though? Yeah. With the way that Ferrari improved last year from when yeah. they started and finished so strongly compared to Mercedes, who'd started to try and resolve problems themselves, yeah. uh, what is it of each car? Or what's, the, what's the aspect that says so Mercedes to come to For me, it's the, the, well, the main reason that, that happened with Mercedes is that there was stuff they couldn't unpick. Like the stuff yeah. that was fundamentally baked in, essentially the rear suspension of the car. Crash the structure position, the crash structures, and right. they've changed that. And I feel like that was. It feels like Mercedes made a bigger change than Ferrari yeah. over the winter, and uh, and I don't think they're that far off right now. And if you, they've then got the potential to to find performance within that again, based on these early comments of the car being quite you know in in a good place, compliant, exactly what they want, then then you then my feeling is that maybe they'll make more progress plus i i still think that as a as a race operation mercedes is is better than ferrari and uh i honestly think the two drivers uh, as a combination are better than ferrari's two drivers um i think leclerc is incredibly quick um uh, and you know science has certainly got something to prove this year but i think that's also going to be it seems like you know science leaving that team he's taking that probably a little bit worse a little bit more personally than lewis obviously leaving that team leaving mercedes because he's got what he wants for the following year mm. uh, and obviously george i think is now in a very strong position within that team and that's only gonna uh, help him so combination of that i'm not saying they're gonna boss them you know i think it's gonna be incredibly tight and i say that you know uh, against the grain of what you guys are saying and you know it's it's, it's tough to say it but yeah I, but i think uh, mercedes might end up ahead and then yeah looking at that bottom uh, five i think i pretty much agree with uh, the order chris had actually um for what it's worth um uh, williams just seemed to have a bit of a bit of a like messy test early on as well mm. didn't they which is why i probably put sabra ahead but those two are, are hard to pick and yeah i wonder whether over the course of the season williams might find more but i don't know 
There you go. We got answer to a we, short question. We got a we got a lot of questions and oh, we'll be, we'll be uh, so yeah, yeah, no, no, it's all right. It's just, sorry everybody. I'm not going to be able to get to all your questions, but uh, I'll take I'll take one more. I'll take one more. It's from uh, All right, all right. Do, do, okay, so from 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 Ashley. Uh we'll go around the horn here. We'll start with Lawrence. Who do you think was who do you think was sandbagging? Love that word. Yeah. <laughs> sandbagging. Well, I don't think so sandbagging is a strange like term informal obviously it means like they're running more fuel to hide their face i don't really think that's how teams work i don't mean i don't mean they're doing it because they don't want anyone else to know exactly what it is of course they won't reveal the fuel load yeah. but they run with more fuel not to you know protect this because if if you go out and you just do qualifying laps you've basically got enough fuel to go out and do one lap and come back you yep. know you might want to do a cool down lap go again cool down lap go again and also you get a much better understanding of how a car works when it's most important which is you know during races by putting more fuel in it you get a more a more stable platform usually when you take fuel out the car does just generally get better but if you're at a point where yes our car works wonderfully well on low fuel and then you get to the first race and you have to put fuel in it and you realize oh wow look at all these underlying like characteristics that we weren't aware of, you know, that's obviously a, a bad situation. So I don't think any team really sandbags. I, th- I think teams which, you know, again, going back to what we said Who wasn't showing the full card? A team that, you know, probably didn't look um, a, as good as they probably are is Alpine. You know, I think that there's an example of a team that just the way they go testing, the decisions they make, uh, you know, just the, the method they have in, in the way of using those three days means that they look a little bit slower than they are. All great context and perfect. I'm going to explain the word quick fire to you soon. <laughs> Alpine. Alpine for me. Alpine for me as well. Really? Really? Exactly. All the point. That's, that's for his point. Yeah. Yeah. And 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 to 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 show that ESPN doesn't understand what quick fire means. Uh, so uh, well, yeah, yeah. What quick fire means? Sandbagging is so interesting. When we used to do a live blog for testing, uh, within minutes of testing, people were like, "Who's sandbagging? Who's sandbagging?" It's a really fascinating thing that Formula One fans have gravitated to, and I think that. I don't, I don't think it's like, I don't think it is a thing people do in the modern era. I think that I actually read about this once. I was trying to I went down a rabbit hole about it. It was a thing that was done in the 80s and 90s when car concepts, etc., were a lot. You 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 could go in a lot more different directions with with certain things, and teams were literally were trying to hide things from other teams. Harder to do that now, I think, with the amount of like photography yeah, that you've got, with the fact that everything's being filmed, you can't actually hide something that well. But you know, 20, 30 years ago, now back in those days, they did. Yeah, yeah. 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 exactly. Yeah, and, yeah. And it, and exactly. Like Braun, Braun Sandbag came, came, came out because out they realised unknowingly, yeah, controversially, like potentially not legal, so they don't want to get that taken off, all that stuff. Yeah, that's it. If a team was sandbagging now, you would probably assume it's because they think their car might not be legal mm. and I don't think any team is like that so. uh, from Vince how many non Red Bull drivers will win a race this upcoming season four, four. Oh. three oh. two, two. Right. he's probably right on it you got to say one and then the Thunderbird music starts well, <laughs> I, I, yeah I, was, I would say five wow yeah I was going to say oh, yeah, six, yeah, yeah. actually. I was going to go wait, 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 wait. Which, which, which six? If you're going to say six. Which I would six say five? that Piastri gets his first win. I say, or sorry, well, first, you know, Grand Prix win, proper win. Uh, Norris as well. I think Carlos Sainz gets a win, at least two. And then I think Charles Leclerc as well. And then Lewis. And and then Lewis this is going to be a great season. I can't wait. Well, I, like, I think I have a little more. Uh, no, No, I think, well, the non-Red Bull, right? So, but yeah, I think Sergio could, can get it. He, he got wins last year. He got a win last year. We got two wins last year. So. Yeah, but there's so many other teams that will be winning. Will he be winning in that mix? That's a but I like that. I like that. I'd prefer yeah. that. I have a little more optimism. I mean, it, it you know... It, is a little felt a little doom and gloom at the end of day three but now that i kind of look back and reflect on some of this stuff if i don't know if i think if teams can like make the proper adjustments if they can build off what they have and they can do it fast enough i don't see why there couldn't be a little more competition 24 in front. races as well it's yeah, a, it's a long season that's what i was gonna say i think that's more why i want to say more numbers than anything yeah. else um was that, yeah. <laughs> more numbers everywhere <laughs> 21 uh, <laughs> we'll do one more so last season uh in bahrain we had aston martin who was a bit of a surprise and they came out they came out of the gates and i don't think a lot of us thought they were going to be that competitive but dan klubein asks which team looks set to make a hot start out of the gate like aston martin did last year nobody yeah i don't think no one's going to do that progress in a solid way or, or maybe, maybe slightly, slightly if Alpine, Alpine didn't show a lot and actually haven't moved. 
I guess yeah, the biggest one would be maybe V Cup compared to where they were. Yeah. Starting yeah. last year, and that might not even be out out the gate. Or McLaren, or McLaren compared to where they were starting last year, but I don't think anyone at Dodger does anything sadly. Yeah, Which compared is, to where they were at the end of last year, year it's hard to pick one that's made yeah. a. A significant step, and Aston was obvious by this stage last year as well. We mm -hmm. knew that was going to be a, a very competitive car. We didn't see it. Uh, Adam asks, "Has Max already won?" Yeah, I think yes. Yeah, uh, but hopefully it can be more competitive than last year because we've just said there'll be lots of different winners, which would take it a lot longer the season. Yeah, I, I think he's okay. What if like Sergio Perez like did his homework? He worked really hard in the off season. He, he might, might win a race. He'd win more races and be a bit closer, <laughs> but he's not going to get anywhere near Max. Yeah. Max is a, a very special talent. He's one yeah, of the best drivers I've ever seen. There are a bunch of those. I mean, we've been blessed with really good driving lineups and like grid, like in terms of not terrible drivers for quite a while. Like even the worst drivers on the grid are of a very good level. It's really improved. But yeah, Max and Red Bull in the combo is just a, is so formidable. There was an interesting quote from Pierre Vacher, the technical director at the end of last year, where he said, you know, obviously we did remarkably well. We won all but one race. But the one area we failed in is that we created a car that, you know, one driver wasn't happy with. So, so, you know, yeah, I don't know I don't how much know how of that much then translated into what they were doing. Clearly, by that point, they were already well on their way to this car that we have now. And because it is such a radical change, you do wonder whether it's going to be just as kind of edgy and to get that top bit of performance that Max finds is going to be just as difficult as it has been previously, or whether they've got a slightly more rounded car. I haven't really got an impression of that either way. And Checo, he hasn't seen, I haven't actually heard a huge amount of what he said, but he hasn't seen like either way, like hugely positive, oh, this is my great chance, or it's not. But um, but if, yeah, if, if, if if, if that was that one was of the one things they looked at over the winter, like how can we make sure, sure that we've got a car that's maybe a little bit, bit you know, you know more, rounded, more rounded, a little bit little more bit towards Checo's, um, you know, style, style uh, apart, from apart from anything else, because, because if the other teams, teams do catch up, up you know, they, they, they will need they Checo's points yeah. to win the Big Constructors time. Championship. So, um, so um, yeah, maybe, yeah, but then is that enough to then put Perez actually on a title fight with Max over 24 races? I don't think so on the basis of what we see. I'm just glad that we're not doing that. There was a time with Mercedes when every year it was it's Bottas 2.0 it's Bottas 3.0 and I feel like people now know that's a good point that that's not that's not happening and to be honest to be honest with you as well I think in Perez's head I think what probably made last year especially difficult is he probably realised very early on this is the best car I'm ever going to drive well at the time it felt that one early on and then as soon as that crash in Monaco and the season got away from him the realisation was he, you know no one would have banked on him beating Max but I think that the crushing realisation that I'm, I'm I'm not even in the fight it must have been difficult to deal with and I think now if he's smart he's probably readjusted his mindset around that you know to be that I just need to be solid. I think what he's doing now is just trying to keep his seat for 25, which I still think he can do. I know everyone's written that off, but I think that if he does a, has a decent year, Red Bull aren't going to move that around. Verstappen likes him, and I think at the, at the moment, keeping Max happy in that groove is all you got to do, really. Anything to add on that one? I Not really. All over the, 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 well, I, I quick fire this idea, didn't I? Um, the, the Miami <laughs> race last year what I think. So Miami and then Monaco. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think yeah, it was yeah. a sign of, um, of it getting to him because in Miami, Max has suddenly gone from someone who he was feeling like he could maybe beat on his day or could be closer to and was getting confidence from. And he took it to another level and was like, hang on, where did this come from? I can't do that. Well, I'm the quick fire. Quick fire, bro. <laughs> uh, guys, thanks very much for doing this. I really appreciate it. Lawrence Edmondson, Nate Saunders, you two guys from ESPN F1, Chris Medlin, a racer? Yeah. And, 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 and. Motorsport Magazine, F1.com sometimes. It's all good. Thanks yeah. very much, guys. Appreciate you doing it.